Uh, dear all, welcome to the seminar Global and National Data Portals, which is part of the 10th um, European GBF Nodes meeting here in Tallinn. And um, also welcome to the people watching online. Um, and uh, we are very glad to host this uh, European GBF meeting. As uh, you can see outside also, the weather is very nice and the spring in Estonia is in uh, full swing. Uh, but uh, on a global level, we are facing a biodiversity crisis and the several reports during the last years have indicated a rapid biodiversity loss. Even, uh, you could say, based on the estimates, um, one to two species every hour. So I, I really hope that during those uh, two and a half hours uh, which we will spend here, we will uh, try to offset in the long term the loss of biodiversity on a global scale and, um, and uh, not only to talk about uh, biodiversity data portals as uh, windows into the past biodiversity, but also as valuable tools um, uh, for research, uh, nature conservation and uh, environmental awareness uh, for future generations. And um, to talk about a little bit about the Est Estonian developments, um, I'm uh, the project manager for the Natural History Archives Network in Estonia. And during the past uh, 10 years, uh, we have managed to unite all of Estonia's uh, scientific uh, natural history collections and uh, also managed to de develop uh, a globally leading uh, software called Pluto F, uh, which also the Estonian Biodiversity Data Portal is based on. And the data portal itself celebrates today the 10th anniversary. And uh, Professor Urmas Kölyag will talk more about uh, uh, this uh, data portal, which has been uh, uh, central to Estonia's uh, participation in GBF. Um, and also, um, recently, Estonia finally selected its uh, national animal, the wolf. Uh, it uh, took almost five years, and finally the wolf had a fierce competition from the hedgehog. But um, finally, uh, finally it was uh, decided, and now we have, uh, um, for the t 100th anniversary of the Republic, we finally have a national animal also. And it symbolizes the untouched nature and uh, also the, the health and the situation of the forest of Estonia. So um, there's a lot of pressure for biodiversity on a global scale and also in more developed countries like here. Uh, different industries, different um, habitat change, climate change, all those uh, factors contribute to the biodiversity loss, especially during the last 40 years which also coincides uh, with the um, uh, doubling of the human population and, and uh, extended use of fossil fuels. But uh, to talk about today's uh, program, uh, so first we will have uh, some words of welcome, uh, both from our host, the Estonian Academy of Sciences and the Ministry of Environment. And then we will have uh, four, I hope, short uh, presentations, about 20 minutes each. Uh, after which we will close the seminar with a short panel about uh, possible cooperation and roles of uh, national and global biodiversity portals. And uh, not to keep you any longer, I would uh, like to invite up here uh, Mr. Jaak Järv, who is the Secretary General of the Estonian Academy of Sciences. Thank you. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am very glad to welcome you in uh, this nice building. In the case of your fantastic uh, symposium, and um, just to have a few words for introduction, I would just say that um, development of internet has changed, has changed um, dramatically our world. It has changed economy, politics, and of course science. And um, 
If you remember the open access movement that started from declaration of Stanford University Library people has also changed the way we publish science data. Of course, initially we had illusions. Now it will be free, completely free, but actually we observed that business, a huge scientific publication business, has still remained a business even within open access uh, model. But uh, still a lot of uh, things have been changed because now we can see that um, data are still more available and the hierarchy of uh, journals and important journals and less important journals is now disappearing because if you can read everything in internet, there is no reason to go to library and the libraries, of course, um, subscribe the best journals as librarians think. So democracy is coming out from, from this moment for sure. Um, and now we are, if we are talking about um, data portals, like your today's um, event and, and the whole symposium, then we have to say that uh, the situation with data portals is a little bit different than open access uh, publications. Because uh, data portals are often supported and very well supported by national scientific uh, Funding, science funding uh, organizations, by governments, by European Commission, uh, I mean uh, the infrastructure uh, program and so on. And <clears throat> this means that a lot of uh, public money is uh, put in and uh, the element of business is not so evident in, in this case. And this is good because we must have information, local and global information, because environment is changing and we have to be informed about these changes and we to follow these trends, because this may be vitally interesting in one day. Uh, as you know, Estonian e-biodiversity portal is now 10 years already in function. This is quite a long time. And uh, this portal fits very well with our imagination or image or vision about Estonia as a e-state. As we are staying or living inside of this e-state, we know exactly where it's a really e-state, where it's a virtual e-state, where it's just a vision. But I can tell you that this uh, biodiversity e-portal is really existing, it's a real, it's not virtual reality, but it's real uh, data bank, huge, important data bank, and such um, data banks are created by people. And therefore, I would say that Estonian science and Estonian Academy of Sciences, we are really proud of people who have worked a lot to put together this database this portal. So I wish, I, I'm using this opportunity to say uh, thanks to all these people who have uh, been involved in, in this um, business and this um, data portal creation. I have heard that some politician has expressed an idea. I don't know what this in Estonia Probably not, but if we have polls, the results always lie. If we have statistics, the results may lie. But if we have big data, the results never lie. It's a beautiful basis for your science. And once more, I wish you a nice ending of this symposium. You were awarded with fantastic weather, and I hope that if you are leaving from Tallinn, you will have good memories from this event and this place. So, 
Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. And um, now I will ask uh, Margit Martinson, the Deputy Secretary General of the Ministry of Environment, to share some thoughts with us. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, real privilege uh, to welcome all of you today uh, uh, seminar on behalf of the uh, Ministry of uh, Environment. Uh, today's uh, seminar on uh, global and national uh, biodiversity data portals is uh, well-timed as we just opened at the uh, annual uh, Nature Conservation Month uh, yesterday. This year focuses uh, on uh, nature and health. My overall, today, um, overall message today is that uh, two seemingly different and competing uh, areas, nature and digital uh, society, are actually complementing each other and creating more synergy. As you know, Estonia is a small country with only 1.3 million uh, people. So we have to constantly um, seeking a new ways of uh, doing things with limited resources. And it's not easy. One hand, we believe uh, that developing uh, smart digital uh, solutions uh, can reduce costs and uh, create new opportunities. And really, I can ensure you, we really like to use uh, e-services, even when we want to, I don't know, uh, pay for a Christmas tree from a national uh, forest or um, fishing cart. On the other hand, we are very proud of uh, our pristine nature and we have a special connection with it. Over 50% of uh, our land is uh, covered with forest. 30% of it is under protection. 80% of Estonian uh, land area and 26% of uh, water area has been taken under protection. Estonia biodiversity is one of the richest. Estonia provides, ex for example, Estonia provides attractive uh, habitat for over 300 uh, species of birds or 70, uh, 76 species were detected in one square meter in the Laelatu wooded meadow. We have been uh, consistently gathering data on environment in Estonia for more than 150 years. Data is, uh, in general, is the basis for information, knowledge and wisdom. We create and uh, collect an unimaginable amount of uh, data in every minute and it only grows. Data could uh, be seen as a resource, I don't know, maybe as a cold or a water, and data is more valuable when it's shared. It's really important when it's shared. Estonians are uh, great believers in free movement of data and developing e-services on the basis of uh, digital av available data. Digital available uh, information enables to make knowledge-based decisions and contribute to transparency about the state of the environment. Collaboration based on data sharing is not limited by physical borders anymore. With a digital uh, infrastructure, we can use uh, data collectiv collectively in a whole new way. Let me commend uh, the people that are working in, uh, on an international biodiversity data and making this valuable av uh, data available. There are more uh, there are over 2 million data records about Estonia in global biodiversity portal. Is it that amazing? One of our priority in ministry is to ensure efficient e-services and uh, move towards 
with uh, open data. Several important nature-related IT projects have uh, taken off in recent years. Since last year, national environmental monitoring data is digitalized and accessible from the comprehensive database called KESE. Of course, we continue to improve and, uh, the database and uh, the services it uh, offers. We are currently developing uh, a new portal for biodiversity data called ELME. Uh, and we hope to launch it uh, in the beginning of the uh, next year. So, we live in an uh, interesting time. Gathering and sharing data globally has never been so simple thanks to digital solutions. So, let us make the best possible use of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margit. Um, and I would li also like to add that uh, yesterday uh, we celebra celebrate uh, the month, uh, month of nature conservation in Estonia. Um, it started yesterday and, um, and also we now, about six days from now, we will celebrate the Global Day of Biodiversity. So important milestones uh, coming up. And um, today is a good day to talk about the global view of uh, uh, what GBF can contribute to the availability and uh, interoperability of biodiversity data. And for this, I'm glad to have here Mr. Kai Kopas from the GBF Secretariat. Please. Leave it to the professionals. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'll start here. If I decide to break into song, I'll probably pick up the other mic. Um, so, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Uh, congratulations on the Academy's 80th birthday, also celebrated this year in a time of, of celebrations, it seems. Um, if I could, I'd like to take one brief personal moment in case he's watching. Today is also the day that my family celebrates uh, the last exam of my 17-year-old in high school. So Addison, if you're watching, uh, congratulations, and I'll see you soon. So. Um, I'm going to talk today about the services and functions of Global Biodiversity Data Portal. Um, in my way, I can't, you know, I'm given a topic and can't quite stick to it exactly. I think I'd maybe like to talk about this slightly more broadly in terms of infrastructure because on the one hand, to talk about uh, the, the data portal, the web presence of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and its participant nodes, um, is a limiting way uh, to view this work. And in fact, as uh, Minister, uh, Secretary General mentioned, um, the role of people, actually both of them mentioned, the role of people in this work um, is critical, right? We may be teaching uh, mach machines, we may be enabling machine learning, but it's humans who are putting these systems together. Um, so, uh, Without much more delay, let's maybe see. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, I'm going to keep the introduction, introductory elements about GBIF and GBIF.org to a relative minimum. Um, we are fast approaching um, the symbolically important, if scientifically, uh, let's say, uh, insignificant milestone of one billion species occurrence records in the global index. Um, this is something that provides us with an opportunity to talk about uh, the achievements of the network um, with a broader population, we think. Uh, we're eager to do that and expect that in coming weeks we will have the chance and we hope that uh, you will uh, join us in, in celebrating that milestone. Uh, for, for what it is and what it does represent, which is, I think, uh, a, a clear indication that biodiversity has reached this condition of big data, if it hasn't already. Again, the numbers uh, are not a pure 
uh, representation of those things. You'll see this is the work of a huge number of groups here, uh, and you can look at it a couple of different ways. This is the most formal way, right? This is uh, the formal uh, participant network of GBIF, uh, which includes 55 countries at this point, um, and another 36 uh, NGOs and other uh, organizations um, who join us in this work. Um, in some ways, this is the most limiting way to talk about it because, as you'll have noticed on the last slide, we also publish data from nearly 1,200 institutions. So this is a pretty simplified view of it, and you can get a bit more complex view of it if we start to look at the actual data points um, on the map. Certainly, there are places to fill in, um, and that is something that we collectively uh, are engaged in every day, whether it's bringing in new participants, new publishers, new data sets, and trying to address some of the uh, gaps in this uh, landscape of biodiversity occurrences. Uh, my colleague from the Secretariat, for instance, uh, and science officer, has been in Moscow uh, this week um, working with a growing network of Russian institutions and individuals from Russian inst institutions uh, who are mobilizing data and beginning to fill in some of the, the blank spots on the map there. And we can look at things lots of different ways. This is one of the uh, roles that we have within GBIF. Um, you know, even from a polar projection, you can, can begin to see, let's see if this works, maybe not. Um, you can begin to see the bright spot of those some 200 million records from Estonia. I think it's uh, quite clear when we look at things in this uh, representation, what an important role uh, our hosts play in assembling this global data in their country, large or small, as it may be. Um, but I'll back up a little bit. What are we doing here? What is the, the actual purpose? Um, in the end, what we're interested in, and that's an unfortunate conjunction of the screens, isn't it, is fair and open data for use and reuse. Um, if you're familiar with the concept of fair, we're talking about findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is um, intended, this entire enterprise of the GBIF network is intended to make these data available freely and openly to anyone in the world, free of charge, uh, for research uses, for policy uses, perhaps for fun on occasion. Um, and we do that by pulling together data from a very wide and heterogeneous range of sources, from uh, natural history collections to field observations, uh, occurrences from literature and on down, and then by using data standards and uh, different interoperable uh, open, soft, soft, open source software tools, we get that data in the hands of users, um, where it is applied in a whole range of topics. Anything that needs to, uh, to answer a research or policy question that uh, hinges on some knowledge of biodiversity on the planet, at least of, at, at a species level now, um, can make use and, in fact, does often make use of data mobilized through this network. Um, our role then is, uh, one way of looking at it is threefold. We want to remove obstacles to sharing data and to using data. So we want to make it easier for institutions that hold data to share it. We want to make it easier for people who need data in their work and research and policy to have access to it. We provide the means of organizing this, regardless of where those uh, records come from in time or space. And in the end, uh, we are really uh, engaged on something that has, uh, for all the novelty of the, the internet age and information age, it does have its roots in uh, several centuries of natural history collections. We want to provide as rich a possible uh, resource uh, through, through the internet to the information that's housed in those natural history collections around the world, in Estonia and elsewhere. The primary source for uh, getting at all of this is through uh, our website, uh, gbif.org, um, which uh, is another place you can watch if uh, you're like my colleagues from the Secretariat uh, and are keen to see when we reach one billion. You can go there and refresh it, you know, repeatedly, day in, day out, uh, it, it will keep popping up. If we go there now, we, I'm sure these numbers are out of date, having taken this screenshot late last night. Um, 
We also provide uh, the tools that enable uh, sharing data through this. One important tool, the uh, IPT, or Integrated Publishing Toolkit, uh, is open source software that's used widely around the world um, and m helps us uh, standardize data and present it uh, from all these different sources in ways that are clearly and easily navigable by users. Um, that is a sort of tool primarily, though, for uh, data managers, collections managers. We provide other kinds of tools, some of them large, some of them small. Um, sometimes we just need to provide sets of, of detailed utilities for the kinds of tasks that uh, our node managers, many of whom from Europe are here in the room, need to perform routine tasks and processes. We also, within the network, have uh, larger initiatives, some of which are uh, clearly not led by the Secretariat, but generate from the broader community. Um, a number of years ago, the Atlas of Living Australia was lucky enough uh, that a government surplus led to an influx of funding. Uh, so in two years, they had to uh, think about what they would build for a biodiversity data management system um, with, if they were given $50 million in Australia. Um, this is more akin to an internet startup than the pace at which uh, someone in a, a government research institution generally operates. We don't operate on those uh, levels of funding, typically. But to their credit, in two years' time, they produced a state-of-the-art enterprise-level system um, that after uh, it was sort of uh, out into the wild, as you might say, uh, their own systems were up and running, and other members of our network began to see its capabilities it has been adopted widely across the network. Um, more than a dozen countries are now running installations uh, based on this system, which we're now broadly referring to as living atlases. Um, and in fact, one of them uh, also uh, may be familiar to some of you people in the room. Um, so uh, with the Secretariat, we also try to coordinate larger activities that are of particular interest to the community. We don't need to lead these things for them to happen. We can use the, the power of the network and our own position uh, among different research infrastructures and projects and partners to help coordinate uh, around services that can be shared more broadly by a range of stakeholders. So for instance, uh, the so-called Catalog of Life Plus initiative that's underway now is really about trying to provide a consistent uh, and reliable global taxonomic service um, that many of the partners around this uh, can contribute pieces to and in turn also make use of these services. This is critical for helping us understand changes in science, some of them driven by technology, some of them simply driven by research um, of uh, various kinds, from traditional taxonomy to work such as the work that's being pioneered here in Estonia around genomic identification of, of taxa. Um, we provide a, a number of other tools and means of accessing this data. Not everything has to go through the website. We provide a robust API uh, which allows people to access information and allows, and more importantly, machines to access information in clearly structured um, semantic ways so that, uh, again, we can use the power of big data to run the kinds of analyses and answer larger questions that were not possible to answer before. And this looks in, uh, you, you know, for any user, um, uh, particu and particularly for any technologist, this sort of structure, uh, you know, you can see this is structured information. Um, we ourselves make use of the API, the Jeff GBEF Secretariat makes use of this API in presenting our own website. So uh, we feel that it's important that we ourselves are confident in the service uh, and its robustness and its flexibility and capacity to represent uh, the knowledge that, it, that runs through the network. There are other uh, tools that are available to do uh, different operations, different analyses, most of them open source. Um, there are some important ones that are developed by a group called R Open Science that really begins to look at distribution patterns and distribution modeling um, and larger analytical questions. Um, we can then, uh, if we sort of scale down to look at uh, how we can improve this uh, overall portal, we, tr we are trying continually to improve how we represent things and also 
to uh, show how we interpret data in the index. So simply from an individual record, you, there are lots of these same sort of fields that you would have seen uh, a couple of slides ago from that uh, uh, bit of snippet of code. Um, this is an interpreted view, and simply by clicking uh, the, the little uh, toggle at the top right of the, right below the green bar, you can actually uh, begin to see, all right, so in the second column we have an interpreted view. What did it actually say in the database? If someone comes even down to an individual, the level of an individual record, they may think that there is something wrong with it. It provides a quick means of at least beginning to see if the problems are of data, the problems are uh, perhaps one of science, maybe the, the uh, taxon that it's identified has changed. Um, but we want to try to uh, be as transparent in this as we are in the rest of our operations, in the information that we present. We can always improve this. So, talking about data interpretation, we know uh, that it's currently the case that several of these systems, most of all of these systems, let's be honest, um, uh, index and ingest data in their own processes, right? So uh, at the top and bottom here, we have just a quick re representation of how the Atlas of Living Australia software and the GBIF software currently process information. And the part that's highlighted revolves around data validation um, and also then data cleaning and inter interpretation. We know that both of these systems, despite all of the ways that they operate well together, um, do things differently. And so for users of each of their services, they may see the same record um, in one system uh, with issues that are flagged or concerns raised about the interpretation or, or some aspect of the information uh, that are um, interpreted differently or represented differently than they are in the other one. So currently we're in the process of uh, re-engineering this ingestion system uh, so that we can uh, have consistent processing of all of these data, whether it's parsing, interpretation, flagging of issues, um, regardless of the system. So that by the end of this year, we expect that there will be, in essence, or virtually speaking, let's say, a, a single uh, ingestion process for data that comes in through GBIF or comes in through the Atlas of Living Australia. These will be represented um, in the same way. They'll, be func they'll function on the same code base. And by designing this in uh, an extensible way, we've also left the door open for other, uh, other entities, other systems to perform the same kinds of operation. We think this is really important, an important step, one that maybe won't be seen by people uh, who are coming to, let's say to the to the websites for fun or to for out of uh, some personal interest in biodiversity, but for those people who are making use of the data in large scale analyses, this uh, is an important step in the evolution of of the overall data processing. So, why are we doing all this? It's not a uh, as uh, someone has once been told by a, a grant reviewer. It's not an archivist project. It is about application. And we are seeing this trend uh, continue to grow. One of the things that the Secretariat does is uh, maintains a literature tracking program, looking at peer-reviewed research and also gray literature, other uh, books, all, all scientific literature, to try to see where the data are used. We're particularly interested in those use cases, right? So uh, the chart you see at the top right represents peer-reviewed substantive uses of GBIF-mediated data, that is data that has come through GBIF.org um, over the past 10 years. And you can see there is a steady trend. While this year we're a, a bit behind uh, our pace from last year and perhaps may fall short, it's been a big month already this month, and we're averaging just under two peer-reviewed uses of data in uh, each and every day of the year. We think that's significant, and we also think that it's great value for money for the governments that have funded this enterprise. Um, so one of the stories that we'll be keen to tell um, on the occasion of this one billion milestone. And again, this covers an entire range of topics, not just nature conservation, species conservation, protected areas. It includes ecology, evolution, biogeography, and into other areas, again, where it's important to understand where people, where, uh, organisms have been, where they are now, and where they will be in the future. Um, whoops, wrong one. 
So I just want to show uh, quickly then um, that we are also keen to give credit where credit is due. Um, so uh, the way that we represent uh, individual data sets is intended to give uh, a number of tools to data publishers, those institutions that are willing to share data. Um, at a summary level, the first page of a, of a data set, we, want, we also want the, under, uh, the users to understand what this data uh, represents quickly. We provide some visual cues about the kinds of characteristics and qualities of the data set. Here we're talking about uh, collections from uh, a, a natural history, uh, a her, a presume a herbarium within it, yeah. Although, uh, if we go, look, there are a couple, there's a stray two animals somehow in this, in this data set. Um, because they're specimens, it may be no surprise that uh, only a quarter of them come in with coordinates assigned, but you can see the rest of the information is quite, uh, quite solid and quite comprehensive. Um, we want to record and present back how, much, how is this data being accessed? So we maintain a log of all searches, or I'm sorry, all downloads made by users that contain data from a given data set. This data set has been in for several years now, and so we're clo uh, closing in on 14,000 different downloads have included data from the Tallinn Botanic Garden. Um, we also, uh, going back to this idea of tracking research uses, um, as long as uh, we can change the culture of data citation, we now have in place an, uh, a rather automated system for recording uses of biodiversity data through this infrastructure. When users download data, they're assigned, a, that download is assigned a DOI. If I go back one, you'll see that. Um, each, of these, each of these downloads has an individual digital object identifier. And if that is cited in research, um, we can actually link it back to individual papers. In the case, uh, as well as data sets, as well as publishers, in this case, we're talking about the Tallinn Botanic Garden. There's 16 papers uh, out in the world that have used data DOIs to identify the fact they've used data from this data set. Um, and what's more, we can list them. And if we look at this first one here, which happens, by the way, to be the 3,000th uh, peer-reviewed data use uh, paper um, from GBIF's uh, history. Um, you can begin to see, you can even come back and look at what the research question probably is or imply what it is. You can certainly come back and redo uh, the, the analysis. This is about uh, openness and transparency. And this is a relatively simple one. We're looking at uh, plant records from Norway that have coordinates without issues, right? So a reasonable data set. That DOI uh, appears one time in that paper and we can track it back not only to the institution, but also uh, to, the, to the data set. And I just was looking before we came. Yeah, so, and then it, you can get into that detail. There's 16 records out of those 5 million that actually came from that data set. Now, this may not be particularly surprising in the case of a paper that's looking in plants in Norway. But those 16 citations from the Tallinn Botanic Garden um, range much farther. There are Estonian researchers that have used it and published it in papers. Ukraine, uh, researchers from Ukraine, Russia, um, many countries in Europe. But when that data was originally shared, it was probably not expected that researchers in Turkey, Uzbekistan, Oman, Thailand, New Caledonia, Pakistan, would be making of use of that same data. This is a powerful example of making use of digital tools to understand the links between data sharing and research. Uh, opens up lots of different paths for uh, reinterpretation, uh, validation, assessment. And uh, it is something that GBIF is quite advanced in compared to other research infrastructures. So we cover lots of other things in the website. Uh, we provide documentation and guidance to the nodes. We cover uh, different projects that are focused on capacity enhancement, sometimes regionally, sometimes in the case of uh, the Secretariat's own uh, funding mechanism, focused on funding for participants around the world to work together on a range of different kinds of efforts, including in this case a, a, a research project looking at their own activities in relation to European biodiversity reporting mechanisms. We support uh, interpersonal knowledge exchange uh, through training programs 
and also mentoring, which has come out of an EU-funded project to mobilize data for research and policy in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. Um, we're actually eager to see whether this provides opportunities, similar opportunities, in Europe for European funding. So any of you who have ideas about approaching that, um, I'm available after the, the meeting. Um, and then I want to come back to people, right? Uh, there is a formal role for people within uh, the GBIF network around collaboration and governance. The nodes meeting that's been hosted here in Tallinn this week is part and parcel of that. But it gives a, also an entire uh, range of opportunities for the individuals involved to develop their own leadership and professional skills. And these are the people that I've uh, had the pleasure of spending the past couple of days with here in Tallinn. And thank you for letting me join you. So uh, to wrap up, um, you know, these investments in infrastructure do have a range of different uses. I, I'm very eager to hear the, the discussion from the next speakers to talk about specific roles of collections-based uh, portals and national-based portals. But we think that it's quite clear that, there, uh, that investments in each of these areas return benefits to the entire enterprise and add up to more than, than the sum of its parts. And I want to give, end with one example, actually, where the global infrastructure maybe enables this kind of, uh, this kind of use of data, but it uh, is unlikely that it would ever really be the kind of thing supported at a global scale. Um, our esteemed node manager and head of delegation from uh, the Irish node knows about this example. This is simply, a, uh, and there are lots of these in Ireland, uh, for one reason or another I won't go into, but it's simply a residential development here. Um, oh, that's a really unfortunate break. All right. So, <laughs> so this is uh, from an ecological impact assessment for a planned neighborhood in County Clare in Ireland, not exactly a metropolis. Um, but as a matter of course, they have consulted the National Biodiversity Data Center, the Irish Node that publishes data also from its national portal, also into the global index. And this is being made, uh, having an impact at a local scale in ways that uh, certainly were not envisioned when this global infrastructure was set up. So uh, well done to the Irish and all the rest of the national uh, participants. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle, and I'm also very eager to hear what is the added value for European and uh, national portals. This was a very comprehensive overview and very advanced actions that you take both on the digital, horizontal and community activities. So thank you for that. And uh, now, please, uh, from the Pan-European Re um, Research Infrastructure Initiative, DISCO, I welcome uh, uh, Dimitris Koreas. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thanks, Kyle, for the very interesting presentation of GBIF. So, in anticipation of the one billion records from um, data mediated from GBIF, uh, let's talk a bit about basically one big part of how that data came together, which is the natural science collections. The other way. So. Um, I'm going to say a few words about, of course, the value of natural science collections today in the world. And of course, natural science collections, as you know, they've been the result of more than 400 years of intensive scientific activity globally. They basically represent a planetary library of ecological, taxonomic, genomic, and chemical information, unprecedented and not replicable. So basically, what we have with that huge investment from the natural science collections needs to return its investment. We need to see how we can benefit more about from this investment that we've made over the last 400 years from both private and public resources. When I talk about research infrastructure, probably most of the minds of people, at least in the public sphere, go in things like this. So this is one of the um, experiments in CERN. But what we're trying to say here is basically that this represents an equally important and actually much more expensive investments of research infrastructures. 
And there is no better proof of the value of those investments over the years, but if you see actually the distribution of those natural science collections globally. There is no big city or country, of course, in the world that does not host a natural science collection facility. And the reason of that distribution is because, because all of those natural science collections, they've been fundamental in supporting biodiversity discovery and geodiversity discovery for all of these 400 years. And this is why it's one of those countries and it's one of those cities invested in developing and maintaining them. So what is different today? What are we trying to do today? Isn't that an enough? Isn't that an adequate model? Well, it used to be for many years, of course. But now, as the changes, as we heard earlier about the, the fundamental changes that Internet brought, basically, the challenges that we have to address cannot be addressed by, through the fragmentation of those collections. And Europe plays a critical role. Don't ask me why, you probably know. But um, <laughs> Europe represents approximately 55% of the world's collections. And within European collections, we have specimens that represent 80% of the global biodiversity. That's fantastic. That's a huge, huge asset that we need to be investing in. We've been working collectively as European research, in, uh, European natural science collections for many years. Collectively, we employ more than 5,000 people full time. That's a very big number for a research infrastructure. We have more than 16,000 people every year moving from country to country to visit those collections and study them. Together, we have more than 10 million public visitors and more than 25 million visitors in our different data portals. So these are very impressive numbers that we need to build on. So this is where DISCO comes in. DISCO is a new pan-European initiative for developing a research infrastructure within the ESFRI context, the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. And basically what it's trying to do, its vision, is to position natural science collections at the very heart of scientific innovation. Not only for biodiversity and geodiversity, but for the bioeconomy and other societal challenges. And of course, our mission on how we would like to do that is by mobilizing, unifying, and basically delivering bio and geodiversity information at the form, the scale, but most importantly, the precision, the quality that only natural science collections can provide. To that end, I'm happy to say that we have today the largest ever agreement between natural science collections globally to basically transform themselves into a unified organization that sees collections as if they were one asset, one European level asset, scientific asset. 114 institutions, natural science collections and collection holding institutions across 21 European countries. And it's not only the agreement to actually collaborate, it's the agreement to completely change their business models the way they do things within the organization so that they can accommodate this vision. So DISCO builds on three, on three main pillars. Data, policies, and probably most importantly, people and the skills they have. If we disconnect expertise from the infrastructures, you end up with empty shells. So for DISCO, expertise, and specifically expertise linked to the collections, is fundamental, is integrative to the value of the, uh, the system. And of course, policies as well. It's about how we do things in a harmonized, synchronized way. Otherwise, you cannot talk about a unified European organization. And these are access policies as well the way we allow and enable people to access our resources, virtually, but also physically. And if you talk about data, and of course, all of that, as I said before, for science, industry, and society. 
So if you talk about data, and if we see the landscape today, the global landscape about the different data classes, the different data that we have been extracting out of the study of the collections, of course we have very, very ex successful examples. I would of course start with GBIF, a fantastic resource, one of the most successful we have globally about bringing together occurrence information from those collections across other um, sources of information as well. Taxonomic resources, genomic information, traits, nomenclature, literature, species interactions. And at a global scale, we have initiatives that actually are trying to bring these data classes together, some more successful than others. But the need has been recognized and the, some of the investments are already there. What we're still missing is the capacity to actually link that information together. Provide a knowledge graph actually of all of that information together. And for DISCO, what we are trying to do is use a fundamental and unambiguous point, which is the collection object itself. The collection object is actually the object that all of those data classes that we're studying have derived from. So you can bring them all back by linking back to that collection object. So linking all of that, which is linkable, it's one of the missions of DISCO in that landscape. And you will see here that we're moving a bit away of using the taxonomic names as the anchoring point, right? We retain taxonomy as a layer of interpretation rather than as a fundamental point of linking all that information together. And this is something that collections can do, unlike other sources of biodiversity information. And by doing that, they can actually ensure quality because provenance and validation is always possible going back to that physical object. So DISCO is actually destined to provide three different classes of services to the scientific communities. One we call the e-science services, a set of discovery, access, analysis, and interpretation services for the information mobilized out of those collections. A set of services that are around physical and remote access. As I said before, we have 16,000 people moving from country to country every year studying this collection. Needs, this needs to be balanced with actually the capacity to provide digital access. And needs to be better organized and coordinated. And of course, support and training services. Without them, without enhancing the skills and capabilities of people to cope with the rest of those services, again, you end up with just an empty promise. So we're talking about a completely different business model, a business model where researchers are moving in countries or are accessing, where possible, of course, uh, virtually information where it's aggregated to a model where basically all of those collections become one European asset. And then they provide services to both researchers but equally important to other research infrastructures. And because that is the link that will allow us in the future to go into cross-disciplinary answering of questions. And we're lucky enough in Europe to have a very interesting landscape of how these research infrastructures are being developed. I'm not going to describe that, but these are the main seven points of the added value, let's say, of DISCO. What could we not do before? and what we could do with. And basically you will see that apart from the linking of the information, the unified access, the cross-disciplinarity, I would like to talk about the economies of scale that we can create. Sometimes it's not only about asking for more money, it's about what you can do best with the money you have. And basically DISCO comes into that space as well into creating these economies of scope and scale that allow to achieve better efficiencies in the way we invest in our collections. It's also about making sure that the collections are not further developed in isolation, but basically they are developed in the wider context of the European priorities, but also the global priorities. I cannot see any more institutions developing their collections in a model where they just look at, taxon look at the taxonomic, geographical, or temporal gaps in their collections, even at national level. We need to see that at a global scale. We need to be able to um, deploy
deploy specialization strategies for our collections, but we need to do that only in the global context. And the only mechanism to do that is by understanding how our collections, our institutions' collections, fit within that global landscape. And of course, it's about... Uh, there used to be an animation in this one, but... There used to be a loop there. <laughs> but basically, this is one of the examples we expect to have in terms of how we see collections basically being... Um, Collections being um, used for societal challenges. This is one of the examples, the invasive and alien species. Full economic cost today for the European countries is 20 billion euros per year. All right? That's the full economic cost if you take into account all aspects of that. Biodiversity-wise, biodiversity loss, and also uh, ecosystem services. This is a huge amount of money. All right? So basically, to be able to respond to these big questions, we need to do that at the scale that is required. And that scale can only be achieved when we have that information linked at the level of aggregation needed. So the look here was that, of course, you start with facilities and collections. You link information not only within collections, but also using information from other research infrastructures. And of course, you provide analysis and interpretation services to scientists some of those needs. So DISCO runs in the wider context of European research infrastructures. That animation worked. But basically this is a very simplified way of research infrastructure, environmental research infrastructures in, in, in Europe at least. And coming from the um, ENVRI cluster community of environmental research infrastructures, you will see that DISCO basically is destined to occupy a very foundational of reference information that is providing then services to other research infrastructures within the European landscape. And you will see some known names within the uh, environmental landscape there, like LTR and, of course, LifeWatch. So DISCO doesn't come as a, comes as a supplement, as a very important piece of the puzzle to those research infrastructures that already operate within Europe. And, of course, funding. For those of you who are familiar with research infrastructures in Europe, you, you will find this slide very familiar as well. But institutional level, national level, and European level are basically the three levels of funding that we usually approach in this kind of research infrastructures. The national level is highlighted because this is the main source of funding. Institutional funding and European level funding are basically seed and facilitating resources, but the main, the heavy bulk of the investment comes at national level. So basically, we need to actually be persuasive enough and convincing enough to our funders at national level. And this is a very interesting discussion. DISCO is going to happen as a collation of different projects, right? These projects come together and they um, develop components and elements of um, the research infrastructure. We expect to become operational by 2025. That means providing end-user services, as I described them before. To that road, 2025, you will see several projects in the pipeline. Some of them have been already uh, funded. Some of them are in the pipeline. Some of them are still to be developed. Um, and you will see some known acronyms in there, probably. But what is also very important is to understand that all of those projects come now for the first time at the European level under a common coordination a coordination that brings together all the people that actually run these projects at the same table to be able to prioritize activities, refine priorities, and basically make sure that we maintain the right level of agility on how we do things within our projects so that we can develop the pieces of the puzzle. This is my last slide. I was specifically this slide basically built to address some of the issues regarding um, and the opportunities regarding the collaboration opportunities that we have at national and European level. And of course, we all start from the institutional level, organizational level, a sub-country level with museums, universities and research centers revolving around that space. 
And then we've seen developing at national level activities at the node level. Of course, we, you all here, or some of you here represent GBIF nodes at national level. Um, we have LifeWatch nodes, for example, and we have now DISCO nodes, the DISCO national task forces. And if you remember, as I said before, national funding is the, pri is the main source of funding for these research infrastructures. And we need to be more convincing on how we approach our national funders. We need to be more convincing on how we need to converge our activities at national level so that we can go back to the funders and present ourselves as a more holistic value proposition that actually can be invested. So, and of course then you have the European level where the priorities become a bit different. They become more scientific. They become priorities about specific communities of practice. And how all of these actually are interoperating is a very interesting discussion. And finally, you have a global level where you have infrastructures that actually play a more thematic role around bringing information together at global scale. Now, the pathways, the pathways that actually link all of those together is something that we need to be discussing, not only on the vertical, but also on a horizontal level. And I hope that my presence here and the GBIF nodes, European GBIF nodes meeting, is actually an incentive to start discussing this in a meaningful way. So, this is a very basic description of DISCO. Just to summarize, we see DISCO as a key scientific asset today and a potential extremely useful research infrastructure with end user services for the entire community. The only way for this to happen is if everyone understands that they are actually part of DISCO. Everyone who is relevant to at least natural science collections. And for us, this is extremely important. For those of you who know DISCO, you know it's being driven by a very small team, at least in coordination wise, but with hundreds of people that actually have been doing a lot of work behind it across the continent. And um, one fundamental difference that I would like to highlight finally is the governance. We usually do not pay a lot of attention to that, but governance and how we actually come together, the agreements, the terms of reference by which we collaborate are extremely important. And DISCO differentiates because it's not just a project, it actually mandates a completely different business model on how our natural science collections operate together. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitris, and, and uh, it was very, um, very good to see all the added value that TISCO can give the European community and already has been giving through different Horizon 2020 projects. For example, Eisting, and we all see the coordination effects uh, within Estonia also. And I should mention that Estonia is also a member of the DISCO proposal uh, with uh, free research universities and the Estonian uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, and also we submitted the DISCO proposal into the national roadmap. So we're trying also from our side to uh, be as active as possible and hope that Estonia will one day be a member of the DISCO ESPRI network. Uh, but now, uh, moving a little bit uh, down to the national levels, we will have uh, two quick um, uh, examples of biodiversity networks and portals working on a national level. And first up is uh, the Netherlands, and Walter Adding from Naturalis Center uh, will uh, have the floor, please. Uh, the, the landscape of um, biodiversity portals online is very diverse. And that is because there are uh, different uses and many different use cases. So there are several different approaches to, uh, to uh, biodiversity portals. Uh, and before uh, going uh, more in detail uh, on national uh, data portals, uh, I, I want to give you a quick overview 
of these different approaches that, that there are, and each of these approaches uh, serves their own purpose. So we have uh, information portals, and you, in several countries you see that this is uh, being uh, established by uh, the CBD uh, clearinghouse mechanisms, for instance, which are um, uh, websites that provide information on, on, on uh, national biodiversity strategies and, and how the, the field is organized in terms of uh, organizations dealing with biodiversity information, etc. Um, we have portals that uh, supply um, not individual data records, but data sets as a whole that you can download and use for your research purposes. Um, example, so an example is the European uh, portal uh, to support the EU uh, directive uh, on the use of public sector information. Um, and then we have data portals, uh, and, and there we can also uh, see different uh, kinds of data portals. We have thematic data portals, we have international data portals, like the DBIF portal that you have seen. Um, and we have these national data portals that I will talk more about. Um, and also thematic portals. Uh, portals that uh, have been created by individual uh, natural history museums, etc. Uh, you see also uh, portals that are um, uh, focusing on uh, reporting by citizen science. Um, a new kind of portals that you now see emerging is portals where you can directly do your research and, and analysis of data. So it's not about discovery of data, but you have the data already and you want to do analysis. And you have portals that, that report uh, the current status and the threats in a country, invasive species, etc. Um, to show you um, a, a few examples on, on how uh, diverse the landscape is, uh, here are a few, a few examples. We have the uh, Arctic Biodiversity Data Service, which is a thema thematic portal. Uh, IDIF Biodiversity Data Portal, which is a portal for researchers involved in the project to, uh, to manage their data mainly. Another example is the Flora of uh, Cyprus Portal, which is uh, a national flora. Um, a Bulgarian biodiversity portal, which is a, is a portal uh, with, with information about uh, how um, the organization is in the country. Um, a data analysis portal in Sweden, and uh, a data portal in France. So these are just a few examples to show how diverse it is. Um, we have national data portals, we have global data portals, but we have also several um, portals in Europe. So, um, and these are a few uh, examples of uh, European data portals. Um, what you see is that most of um, these uh, European portals uh, and, and also the uh, global biodiversity portals, um, they uh, are usually available only in English language. The only exception here is the um, uh, Biocase uh, Europa uh, portal, which is also one of the oldest ones, uh, which is available in 11 uh, uh, languages. Um, we, uh, that, that portal is focusing on uh, collection and uh, observation uh, data. Uh, and the Human uh, European uh, Biodiversity portal is more ambitious and more recent um, project-based portal. Um, that um, shows um, uh, observations and uh, ecological data and, and wants to show um, uh, trends in, in occurrences and uh, in distribution. Uh, we have a freshwater biodiversity portal, so that's a, a thematic portal for Europe, for all the freshwater in Europe. Um, we have a biodiversity information system for um, Europe, which uh, is targeted to... Um, uh, show data about uh, the targets in Europe for halting the biodiversity loss. And we have the European Nature uh, Information System, uh, which is about uh, protected species in Europe and, uh, and protected areas. Um, I looked uh, specifically um, for national portals in Europe, and I found 17 portals. So 17 countries in Europe have a national a data portal. Um, it's quite difficult um, to find these portals sometimes, so there may be more and maybe I have missed some. Um, 
To give you uh, an example of how difficult it is to find these portals sometimes, um, and this is, this is uh, uh, just an example, but uh, you can do that for every country. Um, so I, I was interested here to find whether there is biodiversity data for France available online. So I searched, simply searched in Google for biodiversity data France. And in the results I found one link that seems interesting. It's about an, a news item from 2015 that uh, GB France launches a new national data portal for biodiversity. Okay, so that's maybe what I'm interested in. So I go to that link and then I see that news item and I see a screenshot. I say, well, okay, but I want to go to the data portal itself. Well, luckily there is a link on that page uh, to Atlas of Living France. So that's probably the portal I'm looking for. So I click on that. And then I end up with a demo portal. And so, okay, I think, well, maybe it's not developed yet in France. Uh, so apparently there's only a demo portal available yet for France. This is not the case, there is a very nice portal in France. But this is just an example to show how difficult it is for an ordinary user sometimes to find this. Uh, I think this is quite easy to solve, by the way, so we have to put more focus on that. Um, so 17 out of 51 countries in Europe have a national data portal, about one third. Um, if you look at uh, DBF participant uh, countries, then you see that there is a, a clear um, um, a link between uh, participating in, in DBF and having a national data portal. Because you see that about 60% of the DBF uh, participants also have a national data portal. We are out of the, the countries that are not participating in uh, DBIF, only 16% have a national data portal. And most of these uh, national data portals has some involvement of um, uh, DBIF uh, nodes. Um, so we have seen that, that very nice global biodiversity data portal uh, from DBIF. So why do we still need national data portals? Um, I did not an extensive survey, but I've talked with a few uh, providers of these national data portals, and I heard some arguments here. An argument that you hear very often is that um, they want to have a data service in their national languages, and DBIF currently uh, is only in English, although DBIF is planning to have their portal available also in uh, more languages. So, um, is this actually true? Um, I looked into uh, how, how many of these portals uh, have uh, multiple languages and I discovered that in, indeed 47% uh, have um, a portal in their national language and in English. So apparently people want to serve these portals also to an international uh, community. And 35% have national portals only in their national language. And only 70%, so there's still an, a, a few uh, national portals that have uh, a portal available only in English, well, uh, their national language is not English. Uh, another argument that you uh, hear often is that um, they see the audience for these portals as a national society as a whole, so they see the uh, deeper portal more as a as a portal for, for science and for scientists, where they want to serve also the general public and citizen science. Um, so if that's the case, then you would expect um, that you have functionality in the portal, like a very nice interface and, and, and uh, common name searches, etc. So I looked into the common name searches and I found that uh, a little bit more than half of these portals have uh, common name functionality. Uh, which is not present in uh, DBIF portal at the moment. Um, and also another argument that you hear is that um, they say, well, we want to provide more geographic detail and more uh, layers, uh, layers of uh, geographical uh, uh, data that are specific for our country, uh, like the uh, national parks in our country, and that's not available in DBIF. Um, so uh, I looked into that as well, and, and you see here a few examples uh, that indeed most of these portals provide um, quite advanced uh, map services, actually. 
with, with several uh, layers that are specific for the country. Um, another argument that you um, often hear is, well, we need a portal to show our capacity. Uh, so we, we want to show our funders um, uh, what uh, the progress is in, in mobilizing our data and, and what the data use is. Um, but this is apparently quite difficult to do because you see only 25% of the portals that have a specific functionality for that. Um, and what I think um, that, that we maybe see in the future is that we make more and more use of the functionality of, of global and, and uh, portals that, uh, that can provide this complex functionality uh, to use in the national portals. Uh, all the arguments that you hear is, um, well, we have a national data infrastructure in place, and that's the hard thing to do. And uh, because we have that in place already, it's, it's relatively easy to provide a national data portal on top of that. Um, sometimes you also hear um, interesting uh, that, well, if, uh, if we are a DBIF node and we have a responsibility for a national portal, then we, we, uh, we uh, ensure that we have enough uh, ICT capacity to also do our small ICT things that are very uh, important. So, um, a, a short overview of, of um, biodiversity portal functions. Uh, we have very diverse uh, national uh, data portals, um, but in the basis you see that almost all these portals provide some simple text search, which can either be a scientific name search or a free text search. Uh, they also all uh, have some advanced uh, text uh, search and uh, they have very different approaches for that. Um, but to serve um, a wider uh, group of users, uh, you almost always need that. Um, they all uh, support uh, spatial search, so map, maps uh, where you can search and, and, and view the data. Um, so we have seen that most of them also provide common name services um, and uh, provide uh, an interface in different languages. And then you have a, a wide range of, of other uh, um, functionality that you can see in these portals. And I think that that depends mainly on what um, is seen as uh, the main functionality of these portals, because some of the, these portals uh, focus only on, um, on specimen and, and, and observation data, uh, while other portals uh, want to make a combination with, with species uh, uh, data in the country with uh, citizen science reports, with um, uh, threat status, etc. Um, so you see all these other functionality as well, uh, multimedia, uh, images, video, sounds, um, sometimes APIs, uh, not so many actually, uh, which I found uh, surprising because uh, quite often these portals are built on top of a national um, data infrastructure, so they are built on top of an API. But they don't specifically uh, make that API uh, available for um, researchers so that they can use the data directly in their analysis tools yet. Um, and a good example of a country that's very much focusing on an API uh, and, and uh, has less focus on a national um, uh, a portal is, uh, is the Netherlands. Um, Sometimes you see uh, functionality for browsing taxonomy, uh, bibliographic information, uh, DNA sequences, specialists, etc. What I didn't find, but maybe it's there, but maybe I just overlooked it, is a temporal search. So you see um, name-based search, you see uh, search on, on, on uh, spatial, uh, so on, on where uh, species occur, um, but um, or, uh, searches in time. Apparently, it's something that's difficult to achieve. Um, it's, it, it, we know that it's important, but uh, you don't see much functionality for that yet in national portals. Um, things like measurement tools and traits, um, also not, not present. Um, GBIF uh, portal um, currently also have uh, national country pages. 
And these uh, country pages are uh, more or less a, a mix between some node uh, information, so information about the national node, and data from the country and data about the country, uh, so data them itself. Um, a list of, of publications, so data that has been used, uh, national data in publications. And what's very interesting, I think, is that the DBIF provides these data publishing trends. So that was functionality that um, many people say it's important for our uh, ministries and our funders, uh, but it's difficult to provide, and, and DBIF provides that. And so uh, I think we will see more and more, and I think Estonia is already doing that, that uh, national portals just uh, incorporate that functionality from the DBIF portal. Um, a quick overview of the users, user software. Um, so uh, what we see is that in the past, uh, every country had their own software development, and we are going more and more towards a situation that we have uh, one or more uh, tools that are open source and, and, and embraced by the community, um, and that are implemented in multiple countries. And uh, the main um, tool uh, at the moment, and you heard about that already in the, in the debrief presentation, is the ALA portal. And we see that we have uh, one, two, three, four, five countries currently implementing an ALA portal already. Uh, and uh, a number of countries has planned uh, to do that. Um, but we also see some other uh, solutions uh, used on, on uh, public uh, software. Um, we have uh, the portal in Estonia, Pluto F based, um, if I can say that. Um, we have a, a, a Netherlands biodiversity API based uh, solution in the Netherlands. And we have a CCAN based solution in Belgium. And CCAN is a, is a solution for not serving uh, individual data records, but data sets. So, what would be the ideal situation uh, in a country? And um, I don't know, but um, I see a few components, and you can separate these components in uh, separate portals, but you can also combine them, uh, that you uh, probably will, uh, will want to have in your country. So, you want to have um, a, a portal with uh, general information about the organizational structure in your country, projects in your country, uh, how you implement uh, your uh, regulations, etc. Um, for instance, that can be uh, a CBD uh, clearinghouse mechanism uh, site. Um, you want to have um, uh, data available out about the species in, uh, occurring in your country, uh, together with the status, with the change in, in occurrences, um, with, with reports about that. Uh, reporting mechanisms for citizen science, etc. Um, and you also want to have these, these data uh, portals that you can search directly in the data uh, for primary biodiversity data, so facts and measurements. Um, the difference between species portals and, and, and data portals is that um, species portals have a focus on the country itself, so it's data about the country and about the species in the country where a data portal is about the data that's available in the country, the data that's created in the country, and that data is usually about the whole world. Um, and that's the reason that this, these two functionalities are sometimes difficult to combine, and in several countries you see that uh, they have several portals for that. For instance, in the Norway, in Sweden, in the Netherlands, they have a different uh, portal for species information. A species portal is uh, usually also information that... Um, is uh, being compelled by people. It's not, not just uh, the bare facts, but it, it has been compelled in reports, in distribution maps, etc. And then you have these data sets, and for these data sets, there is an infrastructure in place already. We have the DBIF infrastructure, of course, but we also have the European data portal.eu, and there are nas national uh, open uh, data set portals for public sector open data. So it's not only about biodiversity, but biodiversity data could also be supplied uh, uh, in that as uh, public sector uh, open data sets. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. And um, 
uh, as we are running a little bit behind schedule, uh, the time for questions will be during the panel. Um, and I think one underlying problem to the funding and the co-work co of the national and global portals is that uh, for scientific purposes, the data needs to be available and globally. Uh, but for environmental awareness and certain nature conservation activities, uh, the focus is uh, more on local and national actions. Uh, so we need to find a way to uh, achieve a balance and serve both purposes. And also it's a little bit easier to fund national portals also, both uh, politically and in administrative, administrative purposes. But that also needs to change for scientific driven portals and uh, research initiatives. Uh, but now uh, an overview of the Estonian uh, Biodiversity Network and Portal. Uh, Professor Urmas Kölyak, please. Thank you, Valla. So I will take you to the short journey now, and we will, uh, yes, from space to the ground, so to say. So I'm talking about how it happened that we have now for 10 years data portal and uh, new data portal. Uh, op Actually, it opened a few days ago, but uh, this is the day we celebrate. Uh, uh, oh. Backwards. Good. Uh, all right, this is how it looks now, new portal. It's not anymore Plutef-based. It's uh, also Atlas of Living Australia software-based. Uh, but most data are coming from Plutef platform and from uh, Estonian uh, Ministry of Environment. Uh, so they open data for this portal as well. So this is, but I also recognize today that we have 3.1 million occurrence records, but when you go to the GBIF, you see 2.3 uh, species occurrence records for Estonia. So we will look for the why this is happening. I, I, I think I know more or less uh, many data, sequence data maybe. You're holding it back. Oh, you got it. All right. Uh, actually, it was uh, yeah interesting journey for me. So I was looking back to history during a few days, and I saw that uh, 2001, we actually met um, uh, labs, European labs and uh, American labs in Sweden, in Lund. And uh, we were facing, especially ecologists, but also taxonomists and some bioinformaticians, we were facing major problem because we were studying fungal plant interactions and we were using more and more molecular methods. And we had real problem because we were unable to identify those creatures, especially fungi, inside plant roots or close to the roots in soil. So, we decided we need to build data sets, uh, including different um, data types, specimens, voucher specimens in public uh, collection, scientific living specimens, molecular data, traits, and reference-based occurrence data, and of course, taxonomic backbone. So, and we were international community, so we decided we need online platforms so that we can uh, collectively uh, edit, manage, and share those data sets, and in the, the end product will be service for ourselves and maybe also publicly for identification and communication of DNA based species. And so we developed this platform, it looks like this now, and, uh, and it was growing and growing somehow, and in the end, when we came to the point that we wanted to communicate uh, those DNA-based species, because quite soon it was possible to identify them, but then how to communicate when there is no names for those species? So, and then we came up with solution using digital object identifiers as a stable identifiers uh, instead of full species name. But when full species name comes in, so it takes somehow over, but DOI stays in the system. 
And of course, we were using uh, major standards just listed here. I will go on. So, but this is the community called Unite, and this, this is the driving force for this uh, online platform we were developing. And right now, there is collaboration with GBIF and Unite community. Uh, and what they are trying to do, they are trying to include now those uh, DNA-based species communicated via DOIs into GBIF taxonomic backbone, which means that when, uh, let's say, from uh, data from next generation sequencing studies are coming into GBIF, they will be either automatically or they are already identified against species communicated with, uh, uh, through DOIs. And this means if we, this pilot project, will succeed, it means GBIF will distribute occurrence data on undescribed species. So can you imagine occurrence data about undescribed species and its stable system? So let's hope that this community will succeed. But back to the uh, ground. All right, this is how Estonia uh, uh, shows in GBIF portal, and these are data coming from Estonian institutions. So, of course, Estonia is the darkest place on this map, but there are a lot of data published. And there is one thing I want to, to show you. The, there was one, and there is one uh, scientist, he's over 80 years old. He's, uh, uh, name is Tarmo Dim, and he, he was studying always and still studying uh, aquatic oligohata, so all kinds of worms. And he was working mostly during Soviet time, of course, and so he was collecting all literature published about aquatic oligohata for Soviet Union and globally as much as possible. So he has in his room huge uh, volume of published papers uh, and, and, and uh, printed materials. So he was working for Estonian data portal, so he was mobilizing aquatic oligohata data from publications for our portal. And at some point he started to talk, he's over eight years. Oh, I have those tens of thousands publications about Soviet Union, Britain in, in Russia, in Czech uh, uh, language, all other languages, uh, from Middle East, or Caucasian languages. And I can read them, and I know them, and all data. Can I make a global database? We said, yes, go ahead. We didn't know what will happen. And then, he was mobilizing, he was mobilizing all these data from published papers, he was using last 50, 60 years published papers, he was adding coordinates, uh, exact coordinates to the species uh, locations and samples, and then he just published through Bluetooth this in GBIF. So, and this data set is uh, downloaded a lot, and right now there is only one citation, but this data set was released uh, less than a year ago, so you can imagine there is already one publication using those data. So uh, I'm calling him of eight years old scientist, the most famous scientist in Estonia now, because his data are downloaded more and more. So you can see, you can sit at home and work, and he's very happy. So and this was thanks to this platform, online data management platform, uh, developed by UNITE community. All right, but at some point, Estonian uh, collection managers, they started to use the same platform because they found out that we are using specimen data uh, in this uh, online platform so that they can use also for their collections. And then uh, bird watchers came in and they found out they can use also. And in the end, there was idea Let's see how many data we have about Estonia and make it available. So, and we made uh, uh, this uh, portal, data portal, 10 years ago. So, it looked like this, only in Estonia. 
but we had less than 20,000 species, uh, data for uh, less than 20,000 species at that time. And this is one species some of you know immediately, Arctia Gaia, as it looked data, just two points on the map, and this looks today the same species now, more people probably recognize it. And, and this is, of course, uh, software from Atlas of Living Australia, how it looks like. And you can browse different uh, data, calories, and, and single occurrence records. And most important is now that you can come here and download all data, like you can go to the GBIF homepage. But again, the question, global versus national portals, and what you download, here you will not get the OIs uh, for downloads, and this is, uh, I can see, the, the issue. So, all right, uh, this is the portal, and uh, I also saw on Kyle's uh, slide that he had three species more than I have. I made this two or three days ago, this slide, so you made later a little bit, so we got three more species. So, basically, uh, we are trying to build Estonian dynamic checklist of species based on data only here, so that we have just scientific data and they are coming in and our checklist is growing through this. All right, another feature which I like with uh, Atlas very much is that, and this is I was doing this morning, I was including uh, the name of this house, Estonian Academy of Sciences, and it was automatically found all species uh, occurrences uh, with one kilometer radius. So you can imagine you, you are choosing, uh, uh, let's say, kindergarten, but your children, uh, you ask actually what species are around and if there are wolves, so you have to think about probably. All right, and some statistics, but uh, uh, thank you for my former PhD student. Who, she's the major person behind of Pluto F uh, data management uh, uh, platform. So she became mother in January, so I'm sending greetings to her if she's listening. And uh, I will stop here so that uh, we have to use now time for the discussions. I think it's important. Thank you. Um. Okay, I think the panelists can now already come up stage. And I will give the floor to um, Andre Hügebert from the GBF Belgium Notes, who will moderate the panel session. And uh, we're all curious to find out what are the collaboration opportunities and the added value of different services, uh, both on global and national level. And also congratulations to Urmas personally on the 10th anniversary of the Estonian Biodiversity Portable. Please, Andre. <coughs> So, thank you uh, to uh, Urmas and to the Academy of Science uh, to give me uh, the floor uh, for this uh, panel, which I'm sure will be very interesting. Uh, and looking at the, the presentation, I have a first set of questions, and after these questions being uh, answered, I will give the floor to, to the audience. Uh, so, my first question is, in fact, twofold. Uh, we've seen uh, with the car presentation uh, uh, the, the, the presentation of this consistent data interpretation uh, combining GBIF and ALA uh, into a single data ingestion process, and I think it's quite uh, important. What do you think? Is it good to have this uh, ingestion process? Uh, be generalized to all the data portal, being at the national or regional or global level. And secondly, wouldn't it be uh, uh, interesting to have same kind of uh, consistent tracking of the data use in all these portals? So I don't know if Kyle, you want to say something. About Sounds that? like you're you're asking that of me. Yes. Um, uh, well, yeah. Um, 
I, the reason I wanted to make the point about the data ingestion pipeline is that um, on the one hand, it might seem a little esoteric and technical, uh, but we think the implications of this are uh, quite large and uh, quite large for the community, not just for GBIF and ALA and the Living Atlases community. Um, what it does is provide a, a necessary step to actually think about uh, globally unique identifiers potentially for uh, individual occurrence records. Um, again, if that sounds too technical or esoteric for you, um, I'll put a finer point on it. The kind of tracking that we can do now around data sets and publishers uh, based on appearance and research, we could actually track back to individual occurrences. Right now, you know, it, it happened to be that I showed the DOI that had uh, 16 records from the Tallinn Botanic Garden. And we can click, uh, we can run the same search again and see what records are there. And in the case of an uh, herbarium collection data set, that's likely to not change a lot. You know, if there were a couple more, you could identify when did they come in, perhaps. You may be able to sort of narrow it down. But for citizen science and monitoring data, um, you, we can't trace things back to individual records. There's uh, not that level of uh, permanent, consistent, globally unique identifier. Um, we think this is really important for replicability of research, openness, transparency, but it could also um, be quite interesting for, uh, among others, citizen scientists. Um, it, it might be mean a meaningful reward for uh, school children or people who are just picking it up to think that their records are actually contributing to scientific research. We know in a general way that they are at this point, and we can, you know, kind of scope the, the, the likelihood in certain ways, some respects. Um, but this is really uh, important, and certainly important in the kind of, kinds of things that Dimitris uh, was talking about with DISCO and the role of uh, uh, museum specimens as the sort of hub of all this associated information. Um, so we're quite, uh, quite pleased to see progress being made on that. As far as uh, literature tracking, um, the system that we have in place is, uh, I think, replicable at a national scale. It is replicable um, in other areas of research. And in fact, I, I mentioned, you know, GBIF is quite advanced in this area. It is a working system. Um, we've, we've come up with a technical solution. The challenge is, though, we have to fix the humans. Um, we have to help humans, uh, researchers who are citing data, um, to take that seriously, we have to work with journal publishers to um, enforce uh, citation policies, many of which have them on the books. Um, but if we can actually use these consistent identifiers, we can increase the, the transparency and replicability of science um, and the openness of open data and its applications. So, um, you know, all of these things are um, things that not only can they be replicated, I think it's important that we try to replicate them. Can I? Uh, Demi, yeah. I would like to add something from the perspective of Disco, I'm, especially from your first point about the in, um, integrated ingestion mechan mechanism that GBIF is developing. I think this is an extremely important aspect because uh, when we started um, designing Disco, basically the first idea was well, first of all, the, um, we have a problem about the plurality of the collection management systems right now we have across our organizations, right? Uh, the, the latest um, survey we ran, we had 100? Over 100. Over 100. Across the 114 institutions, over 100 different implementations on how they actually um, capture information as collection management system. There was only three or four solutions that were used more than once. All right? That was impressive. Now, we also ask, how much does it cost you to maintain these solutions? We came up with uh, 12 million per year. It costs us 12 million per year, collectively, to maintain these 100 different solutions in our institutions to collect exactly the same data. Right? It's exactly the same type of data we collect as collection management systems in our institutions. And then we ask ourselves when we, be when we began, would it make sense to just say, let's let's propose one 
that everyone can use. But then we realized that would be almost impossible. The way these institutions are being set up, it's extremely difficult to change how they actually operate and how these solutions are implemented. Because it's not the technical part, it's basically the training and all the cultural aspect. In NHM London, we spent two years evaluating our collection management system. Well, that, that was my previous employer. Um, we ended up in a situation where we said, oh yeah, we need to change it, but we cannot. So we're going to stick with it. <laughs> so basically the whole idea is, unless we develop this kind of ingestion, me ingestion mechanisms, where we can talk to all of those solutions, and basically what we need to be imposing is formats at the point of exit. All right? How you manage your information within your organization is your own concern, and Disco will not go into that discussion, basically. But how you expose that information, what kind of standards, of course, we use, and we have plenty of them. We don't have to use the same standard, as long as the standards are interchangeable. All right? That's also an important aspect. We don't have to use the same standard, as long as we know we can go from JPEG to um, a PNG. All right? And we know what we lose when we move that into that transition. That's, it's simple as that. So I, I think that's a very important aspect, that, and GBIF is leading on that, so I'm very happy to see how we potentially can, can learn from that experience as well. Um, yeah, I have not much to add. Um, most things have been said already. Um, yes, of course, it's, um, it's very important to track the use of, of our data um, because if we, if we can track that, then we can take um, uh, good decisions on where to put our resources in, our resources in, uh, in hours that we spend and our focus uh, for uh, our funding, etc. Um, in terms of, of, of uh, in, in ingesting data and, 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 and harmonizing data, um, this is a, a process that is very, very expensive and hard to achieve. Um, so I think, yes, on a national level, uh, we should try to leverage from, uh, from all the work that's being done on a global level and on and, and a European level on that, and, and try to make use of that uh, infrastructure that's there. Um, and yes, it is true that, that um, it does not depend uh, much on what standard you use, as long as you uh, use a standard. Uh, although it helps if you use the same um, framework for that. So uh, to give a, um, a very um, simple example, let's say that we have data coming into GBIF um, that um, has country information, so the country where uh, it or originates from. And that country um, then is uh, provided as a name for the country in different languages, different spellings, etc. So GBIF is uh, harmonizing that to um, uh, standard language codes. Um, if then another portal um, also harmonizes that uh, to another uh, standardized uh, language code, then still the, the data scientist has to do some work in data wrangling if there, he wants to combine data sets from these different portals. Uh, if you use the same standards, of course, it will, it will benefit from that because he can immediately um, use all these, uh, these data coming from these different portals together. Um, yeah, I fully agree with all the things you already said and it's tracking and it's really important. I just would like to go back to a little bit of uh, history and, uh, and uh, uh, the example of uh, JB France and what we've did with the Living Atlases community. Because it's, uh, so I, I'm Anne-Sophie Archambault from JB France. I'm also the European representative of the JB Nodes. And on behalf of all of them, I want to thank you, Estonia, for hosting us here. It was really a pleasure. And um, yeah, to, to come back to the portals, it's so that uh, um, following the um, implementation of the Atlas of Indian Australia, they did a presentation on what they uh, offered and it's so that when we saw all these uh, modules and possibilities we were really interested in and they told us that the code will be open and fully reusable. So we wanted to uh, launch a, a national portal for all the reasons Wouter presented, uh, the need for a national language, the need to access not only for researchers, but also for all the national organizations, NGOs, um, 
So we decided to use the module of uh, Atlas of, of Living Australia, and uh, Spain and France were the first one who implemented them uh, in our national uh, uh, countries. We face issues like uh, language problems. We have accents in our language. We don't exist in English. So we, we work a lot with this. And we also documented the, um, the code because uh, it was shared and, and free, but it was not really well documented. So we really work all together with Australia at the beginning Spain and France to um, make it more uh, easy to reuse. And after we tried to, we thought that it was a really, really well, uh, um, uh, we, we ended with our national portal in Spain and France, and we think that it was a really interesting uh, progress, and we wanted to share it with other nodes, try them to uh, implement all their national portal really easily. And so we began to uh, make the community growing up, and we organized workshops, training, really, uh, close well with uh, Australia, and so now we are really happy to see that there is more than 13 uh, uh, that uh, national portals already in production um, with uh, the Atlas of Living Australia modules, and it's it's also a question of uh, uh, IT community inside. I think the network uh, inside the JBF community is really really important. And it's really helpful. The IT people can talk together. They enrich themselves with the lots of um, of coordination, contribution, uh, exchange, workshop training. And uh, there is lots of modules. They, they, they now can develop new things all together. And for sure, we will try. I think to uh, the tracking system is something we would like to see at national level. And I stop because I talk too much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my second question is uh, regarding the people behind uh, the, this data and this data portal, being the collectors, the curators, the developers, uh, but also the practitioners or the scientists or the citizen science, all, all people that are very often not enough visible on, on this portal. And my question is, how could we give more visibility to to the, the hard work and the effort of these people, especially in the context of the general data protection regulation. Who wants to start? Yeah. No, I just want to bring a very concrete example for that because um, um, recently uh, a joint working group between RDA and Tadwick concluded its work was specifically on addressing this issue. And it was how we capture and convey information and we keep the provenance of all the curatorial actions, especially for collections, for example, going back to the physical object and its transformation into the digital surrogate, and basically how we convey and package all of that information so that can be exposed and um, communicated as part of that final digital object which represents the, the record. And uh, this group, um, as I said, to join RDA, the Research Data Alliance, and Tadwick group uh, developed a, um, a recommendation that uh, is now under evaluation um, from the RDA, um, and it's going to be submitted also in Tadwick, hopefully for formal endorsement and um, uh, ratification as a as a new. We'll see if it's going to be a new standard or not. Um, but. I think these kind of activities help a lot, but this only addresses the technical part. All right. The main problem is going back to the collections, for example. Is this information captured in the first place somewhere? Because, all right, yeah, if it is captured, we'll find a way to convey that. It, it, is it captured? Because in most of the cases, my experience, at least in the organizations I've worked, is it's not. All right. So how can you make sure that you convey this information and you give credit to people if you do not capture that in the first place? And if you do not maintain the value chain, basically, from the physical object to the digital record? If that link between digital and physical is broken, then the, only, the best thing you can do is convey a sterile phys digital object, digital record, without any ability to go back to the information linked to the physical object itself, whatever that can be. And this is not a technical issue, I'm afraid. 
Yeah, uh, uh, having spent three days in uh, meetings not thinking about GDPR, thanks for reminding me, Andre. Um, <laughs> So uh, for uh, our part uh, at GBIF, we are um, in the midst of uh, laying out exactly what our relationship is to the general data protection regulation. Um, it's not clear as an international network uh, at this point precisely uh, the terms under which we, we fall or don't. Um, we're, we expect to resolve that um, in coming days, perhaps weeks. Um, in the meantime, it's quite clear that there is, we have an interest uh, for, for, as a network and community in being able to represent human activity around all of these different uh, materials, uh, not necessarily material samples or specimens, but uh, kinds of information. And that includes data sets, uh, publishing institutions, uh, published research, even down to the level of occurrences. And what we are currently investigating is trying to make use of a, a separate system called ORCID, ORC ID, um, that could uh, provide a means of uh, simplifying the process of making these connections between these different things. Um, it is not intended as a you know, social networking exercise. Instead, we really do want to represent the activities and expertise within the community um, and do it without establishing um, you know, some other kind of registry around uh, that kind of information. So um, we are eager to see, uh, to make it clear that there are humans behind this work in many different ways. It is something that I think historically uh, the community has been relatively poor at. But um, you know, as any of you uh, know, being involved in biodiversity information, usually you know, you're working around people with huge egos. So it is kind of all about them. Uh, so it's no surprise, right? Thank you. What do I have? Um, so there are no, uh, no standards yet for this. It's good that there are some plans for that. Uh, use work IDs, augment on that, et cetera. Um, Already you see um, some uh, national portals have a very practical uh, use, way of uh, using um, information about uh, experts in, in their country. I think it's very important to, to display the expertise that you have in your country. Uh, and that's uh, often overlooked, uh, but some portals um, um, simply deal with, with um, data that they cannot provide because it's sensitive data, so they cannot provide it in full detail. But they provide the contact information about uh, the experts who people can contact, uh, and they can uh, give that detailed information. I just wanted to add uh, one, one more small comment that it's not only about giving credit to people, it's also about and I would say from a scientific perspective, maybe more importantly, is about keeping the provenance and the quality. If you do not know who performed what, at what stage, and what context, and you miss that information, basically you are almost unable to understand the, um, the progress of that transformation of the information from its original state to the final state that you are using. So it's important to keep that purely also from a scientific perspective. If we want to be keeping provenance information really relevant, we need to be able to understand and know who, what, when, why. It's simple as that. Uh, and Sophie, you want to say something? No, well, no I think it's, it's, it's right. The, the idea also when, for the national portal, when we develop, it's also to better recognize all the national institutions who, who, who help to publish the data, who work behind, and uh, yes, after all the what you say about uh, the importance of uh, knowing who is doing what, and the possibility uh, reference to the, the, the source is really important. And I think the, the ORCID uh, uh, system will be really nice when it's something I think we'd, it's really expected and, and it's, it's gonna be really uh, a good improvement. Okay, then my third and uh, last question to the panel is about uh, governance and uh, changing or redefining the business models. So, do you see a need for a coordination entity here above all the, the known initiative? 
Would it be the United Nations uh, UNEP or would it be another actor? And if we don't find an actor, probably one of the GAFA will take the role. So what is your opinion about that? I probably shouldn't speak, but I, I can't help it. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I think we are mature boys and girls to understand that we need to collaborate between us already. Um, we already spent a lot of money on developing organizations and I think we need to invest and basically make them the best we can out of what we have. Um, I don't think we need a chaperone for this. I think we just need goodwill and sitting around the same table and understanding uh, what are our responsibilities and benefits from working together and how we can work together and how we can um, present ourselves as a more integrated, more holistic, more unified community. And we've made a lot of steps already, I have to be honest. So we're definitely not starting from scratch. I don't see the need for a, um, an overlooking organization for this. I might be wrong. But first of all, let's see how we can um, pick up our pieces together and basically work together. And if we cannot, then maybe someone needs to lead us. But I'm not sure we need it right now. Um, thanks for the leading question, too, because I feel like this was a prompt to uh, plug a meeting that uh, GBIF will be hosting this summer um, that will be looking precisely to bring uh, as many as we can of the, the relevant actors to talk about um, precisely how, to, how we can coordinate and coordinate better on the longer term. Uh, Demetrius showed uh, an example from CERN, and they're always a, a useful example for us, um, as well as the astronomical community, where researchers get together, and uh, particularly in the case of, well, in the case of both of them, when you're going to ask governments to spend uh, several billion dollars, billions of dollars on research infrastructure, they need to have a clear idea of what it is they're spending money on and what you hope to achieve from it. Most of the advances that we've made collectively as a community have been uh, project funded, incremental, um, relatively short term. Um, you know, DISCO actually has a, a, a bit longer trajectory both in terms of projects already done and those coming in the pipeline stitched together. We need a similar sort of long term roadmap collectively that we can all work toward um, and be able to know that there are certain areas where it is clear that uh, you know, we may be able to take our piece and we may be able, not be able to take it now, but we can take it when this happens um, and understand where we fit in that broader landscape. That's precisely what we hope to begin with this discussion uh, in late, uh, late July in Copenhagen called the Global Biodiversity Informatics Conference 2. Um, and um, we're eager then to be able to share the results more broadly because the only way that we can get to this sort of model is by having established that trust and level of cooperation uh, among all of the relevant stakeholders and actors. So, okay. uh, Walter, want to say something? Um, yeah, I, I think you don't need so much a, a governance structure, but you need to have some networking infrastructure in place. Um, to be able to collaborate, um, and we have that already. We have uh, GBIF, we have TEDPIC, we have uh, CETA for the collections in Europe, uh, the DISCO community, uh, we have RDA, so we have these, these networking uh, infrastructures already, and we are uh, making more and more use of that uh, to work together. Yes. <laughs> I want to contradict myself a bit. Um, just because we don't need a sh chaperone or someone to lead this and we can organize ourselves, and I agree with everything you've said, doesn't mean that there are contexts in which we can operate. And one of the things I'm usually saying is the same way we develop now European research infrastructures, some of you might know that OECD has developed um, certain recommendations about the development of the global research infrastructures. And in my opinion, at least, these global research infrastructures need to be predicated on, on top of continental level pillars. 
and we have the actors already. I, and if I want to be a bit ahead of myself, I would say that, yeah, GBIF might have a role there in that global level as a potential um, facilitator for enabling the discussions on, on a global level and how bringing together local players, national players, and European, uh, European continental level pay, players at that discussion under the Global Research Infrastructures Initiative. And we always need to position ourselves in these contexts because also the funding is where it goes. And um, we already see that that, that perspective of the, of the global uh, development of research infrastructures is, is pushed very highly in the agenda, slowly. And you, as Europe evolves, and I'm happy to say that Europe is leading this, and I'm really happy that finally Europe is leading something, but uh, Europe is leading that, so that's really good, and we need to benefit from that and leverage the, the fact that now we position ourselves in a much better um, um, way than other continental level initiatives. Um, sorry, but we need to praise our continent a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and you must not forget that JBIF was launched after discussion from the OECD, the OEC, oh, sorry, uh, in English, OECD. So it's kind of uh, already chevron. Okay, thank you. Is there some time for a few questions from the audience or? Not really. Not really. <laughs> okay. You didn't know the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. You want to close? The are there, any, are there any urgent questions? Urgent and short questions, then. Shorter answers. <laughs> not, not difficult questions like the last one. There is one, there is one. Okay, please. Oh, you. My name is Rui Figueira, I'm from Portugal, the non-manager of GBIF. Uh, my question will be, many users uh, use, uh, don't know the data, then combined with other types of data. I'm thinking on remote sensing, perhaps climate data, all environmental types of data. Thinking on the portals, global or national, do you think that we are uh, at the point that we can serve this type of needs on combining data with other types of data, or is there something that we should think and plan on. Um, thanks, Rui. Yeah, I, I mean, this is exactly the kind of integration of other data streams that uh, the Living Atlas's development was intended to produce. Um, you know, basically, they had two years to start up and much uh, more than they could uh, handle to focus solely on biodiversity data. They wanted to make sure that that was useful and applicable in national contexts with lots of other kinds of information. So the modular, de the development of uh, all the various modules that are part of the Living Atlas's software um, are exact expressly to bring in those kinds of elements and provide a, a fundamental research tool, an integrated research tool for questions, again, that, that pull in aspects of biodiversity, uh, that biodiversity data, so. Can I be provocative here? <laughs> um, all right, so, um, because we've been discussing that already within RDA as well, and uh, I'm, I'm now also a member of the technical advisory board of, the, of RDA, but the idea of data agnostic, data interoperability, is a ridiculous idea for me. It won't happen ever. Um, that idea of all data that needs to be interoperable to solve or potential I links between data that is out there will never happen. The only way we can build data interoperability is through specific step-by-step -step use cases where we gradually build interoperability by concrete examples on how we really need to build links between one data set and another data set. And the only way to do that is when you have these scientific cases in place. So research infrastructures, to come to your question, need to engage very closely with these scientific cases, with these communities that actually set the questions 
in the first place. And they need to start working on interoperability on that basis, not on the basis of the generic agnostic interoperability. Of course, there are cases where you can do that. I mean, you can have interoperability in terms of people or through orchids, but if you really want semantic, semantic linking between different domains, it needs to be approached on a much more concrete way. All right? And this is at least how we approach it now in RDA, where we start building this case by case. So research infrastructures is their responsibility. And I think GBF is, is highlighting this, and I'm really glad, and I hope DISCO will be doing the same in the future. But it's when you come very close to the scientific needs and you say, all right, guys, what exactly do you need to link and why? And let's look into that detail and then put it aside and build on that and the next one and the next one. It will take years. But this is the only concrete way, for, for me at least, and the way we see it in RDA now, that you can build data interoperability. Thank you. I take this now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andre, Kyle, Wouter, uh, Dimitris, and Anne-Sophie for your contributions. And I think we managed to put together a lot of information into those two hours. And there's a saying in Estonian that in the start you don't get going, but in the end it's hard to stop that the same uh, principle apply today also. And just for the information for Estonian viewers, you can uh, today watch Ulmas live at the Estonian National Television at seven in the, in the show Ringwade, when, where he will talk about the uh, National Biodiversity Portal anniversary. And uh, we all thank you for coming and visiting Estonia and Tallinn. And I hope you have a nice spring and get to spend as much time as outdoors as possible. Thank you. <laughs>